Hello and welcome to Gone Fishing. It's a podcast from the Northeast Business Resilience Centre, aka the NEBRC, focusing on all things cyber related. Our aim is to help raise awareness and understanding among business audiences, supporting them to be better prepared and protected from the growing issue of cybercrime and fraud. I'm Rebecca Chapman, Director of the NEBRC and a Superintendent at South Yorkshire Police with nearly 30 years policing experience across uniform and CID. And today I am delighted to be speaking to one of our ex-students, Matt Chambers, NEBRC Cybersecurity Consultant and Security Analyst for Northumbria Uni. Hello Matt and welcome, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. So just to say a little bit about your background, so you're still working for us at the, at the moment, um, you're not a student anymore though, uh, cybersecurity consultant analyst for the NEBRC, delivering a wide range of cybersecurity services to clients of the NEBRC, from training packages to offensive testing, help and advice with Azure or Office 365 configuration and policy reviews. He's also conducted OSINT, Upon request, open source research from individuals to assess their attack surface from cyber criminals, alongside developing a guide for stalking and domestic violence victims to help sanitise their digital lives. For his day job, he's a cybersecurity analyst at Northumbria Uni now, investigating compromised accounts and leading projects for continued security improvements. I also know that you're involved with the cadets in the Navy as their IT manager and you were instrumental in the Dirty Rotten Scammers research for the ITN, which appeared on the BBC this summer. So, all those roles, you're obviously a really busy person, Matt. Tell me a bit more about your roles, maybe starting with the NEBRC. Yeah, so I've been with the NEBRC since the beginning, um, and it's been quite a long and fruitful journey, uh, working through every different aspect that the NEBRC has to offer. So, starting out as a student, uh, working my way slowly up to uh, working and helping review their uh, Azure and Cloud Estate uh, in the last couple of months. So with the NEBRC, I've done almost every job uh, that there was to do. Uh, the only thing I think left was a web assessment. But uh, OSINT is probably the thing that I've done the most and has followed into the work with Dirty Rock and Scammers. Yeah. So how did that how did that how did you start all that work with the dirty rotten scammers where did you begin So at the beginning it was basically a conversation uh with them about oh we we want to do this series about uh people that have been scammed in the past and we want to be able to understand uh what information was out there that maybe led to their compromise and uh, them losing their money and what they could do in the future to uh make sure that it doesn't happen again so uh, that initial conversation then progressed into a set of names that we got written permission for uh, from them to go out and do some research on them, which involved finding almost everything that we possibly could online from what phones they used, where they lived, uh, what bank account systems they used, all of those kinds of things, previous passwords, and correlated it into one nice, easy to present report to them. And when they were presented that report, we also provided some uh, guidance on how they can prov- uh, like reduce the information that's out there and be able to secure their digital lives a little more in the future so that they aren't potentially a victim again. Um, and there was about 35 people that were presented this information. Um, and the show lasted for, I think, eight or 12 episodes. So, What, was, what were the big howlers? What did you find? The majority was shared passwords quite a lot of shared passwords between accounts so an account had been breached or uh, their password had been leaked in the past and it was still being used to that moment so some of the people fully admitted on the show that when we presented them with their password they admitted that that was the password that they used for everything and even after their initial compromise they hadn't changed it on everything they just left it as it was because they didn't think it was the way in So that was one of the main ones. And another one was social media. Social media settings not being private and allowing people to know when they were going on holiday so they knew when the house was empty or what kind of companies they were interested in and what kind of deals phishing emails would uh, uh, appeal to them as an individual. Okay, so I know we're trying to sell sleep, not fear, and all the rest of it, but were were they shocked? Yes, very much so. So the reactions on the, uh, the show were quite raw you could see when they were actually 
reading through the information and being asked questions upon the information. Is it valid? Is it accurate? And almost all of them for the information we provided was accurate to that moment. Yeah. So in terms of like um, uh, open source research, how easy was it to find those details? Some people are much easier than other. It's very, very much dependent on the individual and how they interact with the internet. Some people have had a lot of older accounts that they forget about because we all have hundreds of accounts. Those ones are slightly easier to find information on, on rather than the people that are, that are creating accounts now and are new accounts on fewer sites because quite a lot of the privacy settings are enabled by default now whereas previously you had to opt in to those privacy settings okay so would you say that your interest in this side of things so cyber security side of things is something that you've had from being a, a child or is this something developed later yes yeah, so i've always helped out in it so when i was at secondary school i was always trying to find ways to get around the blocks that were in place for things like social media or youtube or any of those kinds of sites so that was when i first started to learn a little bit about cyber security and it was trying to find things to do on my break with computers that were slightly more fun than doing my homework. And then <laughs> going through there, started helping those people out a little bit because my best friend's dad worked for the school as their IT manager and went through, started helping him a little bit. He taught me more just because he knew that it was better for me to learn and help out in the right way. Going to secondary school, again, same thing. Started helping out their IT department in my last two years to then be able to go out, do some little bits of security testing on their estate with their permission and providing my feedback to them. Which all flowed very naturally into a cybersecurity degree. So tell us a bit about your degree and and did you learn anything more on it or did you learn more from doing the stuff that you do outside of work? So I I had quite a, a mixed way working at uni. So the first two years were the standard uni for fair courses, programming, because even in cybersecurity, you need a lot of programming. There's a lot of things that can be automated to make your life a lot easier when working in cybersecurity. Uh, but at that point, we started, when the NEBRC came around and knocking and looking for people, we started to realize that instead of just learning about it and doing it at home on capture the flags, we could start implementing it a little bit in the real world. So a few of us started to take the course and augment it a little bit. So adding additional classes as volunteers for the university to teach little bits more about cybersecurity and helping them test their estate with their permission to find anything that was configured wrong or had vulnerabilities and reporting it back to them. Um, and that's why I started doing it uni in my second year with the NEBRC as an additional project. Third year working with the NEBRC and the university is when things started to actually quite pick up. So the course got a lot more interesting. It got a lot more in depth about cybersecurity, started to work a little bit about how defenses are on cybersecurity, um, which was more what I was interested in. But it was a shame that it took till a third year to, to really start progressing that bit. Yeah. So do you think that universities could maybe teach slightly differently in schools? Yeah, so uh, I don't think cybersecurity is probably the best thing to teach at schools, In just in my opinion, because there's schools are quite understaffed when it comes to their IT departments. And if you're teaching younger kids about uh, offensive testing or hacking, or ha like even if you're teaching them the countermeasures to those, some kids are going to go out and learn the reason to do it or the way to do it. And it might make them a little bit more overwhelmed at the, the staff inside at the schools. But at universities, I think it's highly dependent on the university that's teaching the course. There is no standard cybersecurity course that's taught across the UK. It's very much uh, a homegrown effect by each individual university. So there are other universities that teach it more practically, like Abate who teach a very practical way of cybersecurity, lots of breaking into their own systems and then finding ways to defend against it and writing reports on that for if they want to go out and do pen testing or vulnerability assessment. Uh, but then there's other universities, which is more theoretical, like uh, Sheffield Hallam's course and Northumbria University's course is 
a little bit more. They mix in some of the practical side and some of the theory side, which gives their students a broader range of potential outcomes. They could go on to do cyber analysis, which is what I do, or they could go out and go into pen testing, which is what other people from graduate from these universities do. And it gives them more options when it comes to a cybersecurity career because they have a thinner knowledge but of more areas. So would you say that working at the NABRC during your university degree, I mean, most students go off and get a job in a pub, don't they, or waiting on tables and you, you work for the NABRC. Did you think that has helped you get the job that you've got now? Definitely. So it uh, also allows you to help build relationships as well. So it's not just about the amazing things that the NABRC teaches, such as going out and doing offensive testing uh, with company's permissions on websites that allows you to put what you've learned in theory into actual practice and helping secure a company's network or a small business's network against possible cyber intrusion. But it is the also the way that the NEBRC is taught, uh, the people skills as well, the relatability. It doesn't matter that someone might be able to break into every single system in the world if they can't iterate why that's actually important to the person who owns the business because you can talk very technically to people about uh, proxies and firewalls and all these kinds of things and quite a lot of small business owners that's not what their job is they're they're that's not what they're interested in they will know everything about their business but how do how does the cybersecurity industry talk to those business owners in a way that they understand and that's what the NEBRC is really useful and really good at training individuals how to be able to relate that information properly. That was good to hear. Yeah. So just a little bit about uh, some of your other roles. So what do you do at Northumbria Uni? So at Northumbria University, I am one of their cybersecurity analysts. So uh, that involves uh, searching log data and going out and finding co- uh, potentially compromised users, um, people that might have had passwords breached, or people that have clicked on phishing emails, reviewing phishing emails, and also going out and looking at our systems and making sure that they aren't vulnerable to anything that comes around, uh, which, as you can imagine, is quite a big project when it comes to the scale of universities. And it's making sure that if we do find anything, we get it patched, we get it mitigated as quickly as possible. But I'm also leading several projects within the university, which isn't just continued operations it's not just continuing what we're doing keeping the house at the same level we're expanding our cybersecurity team we're leading projects where we're implementing probably the biggest thing that every individual should be doing is two-factor authentication so at the moment every single system is being migrated to a 2fa system and every single user including our students are being made to use 2fa to access these systems which does reduce the attack surface of things like phishing, of password brute forcing by a huge amount. And those kinds of continuous projectile improvements are something that the university is is quite focused on at the moment, which is why I'm doing so much of them. Yeah, I can imagine, Uh, given recent events as well. Yes. Um, So just tell us a little bit more about the cadets. Yes, so uh, I've been a civilian instructor with the Sheffield Sea Cadets for many years now. Um, and became their IT manager in 2017 for the Sheffield Sea Cadets. Um, And that is basically installing a full set of uh, systems and tools that allows them to teach uh, cadets or under-18s a lot easier. So having projectors installed in classrooms that have logons and storage so that staff, when they go home to write a lesson plan, they can immediately show it to their cadets when they come into class. Uh, it doesn't matter where they are in the building, they can always come in uh, and use it and send it up in a secure manner that helps them by being able to understand that whatever they do on the computers at the sea cadets, whether it's regarding the, the cadets' data, is secure, as well as being able to actually use the systems and it not being so complicated that it makes the instructors unable to do what they want to do, which is to help under-18s to teach and learn about uh, skills. 
And so are they teaching them cybersecurity skills as well? No, no. unfortunately not. There's um, one individual out of the group that is interested in IT and we've taught them as much as we can safely about how the systems work at the university and how they work at the sea cadets and how all of these things interact together and how the internet more works. Um, and they're going to be going off and continuing and going to get an apprenticeship in IT. Not because of that, they were already interested in it, but they've given them a speciality that they want to go and pursue a little more. What do you think then uh, at the moment, so in your role as an analyst and all the things that you've seen in the, the NEBRC along the way, what do you think the biggest risk is for businesses? Uh, the biggest risk for businesses uh, is going to be the users that are using the business and their passwords, their uh, email phishing uh the end user is going to be the biggest problem for people. People is always the biggest thing because most of the time to have a system compromised is going to be a user configuration error. So someone who went out to go and implement that system to install it will have clicked a setting wrong or to make it easier, they'll have set something. That's not the, the technology's fault. That's not the person who installed the software's fault. It's just we as people make mistakes. It, it happens all the time. And it's the same thing as shared passwords. Shared passwords are a thing that we use to make our life more convenient. We don't want to have to remember 300 passwords for 300 accounts because it's not going to work. We're going to go out and we're going to reset that password every time. Uh, so 2FA does help to mitigate that a little bit. But having unique passwords managed by some kind of password manager will reduce the end business's scope of like their attack surface. So those two things are quite big problems for small businesses because the users are are always going to be the the easiest thing to break in a computer system. So when you've dealt with like clients at the NEBRC, um, have you found that they've been shocked about what you found? Uh, it depends what we've found, I think, more than anything, because some people that have had a little bit more of a tech background might understand the the importance of uh, when we say, oh, your website's vulnerable to X, Y, Z. Uh, this means that someone could log in and change your pricing or they could gain access to your customer data. Some of them understand what that means and what that means to them, but some people... It, it's not their job. They're not interested in technology. They're just utilizing it to get a little more business. So those people are are more common, I would say, for clients at the NEBRC. But it, it's incredibly rewarding that when they come back or we get an email back from them saying, we've gone and fixed these things. We've gone out. We've under like read more background research and we understand why you're telling us these things now. We've gone out and we've done the additional research to be able to say right how do we actually fix what the nebrc has told them and those stories are more frequent now than i think they ever have been and doing follow-up testing two years down the line with the same client and you're not finding anything that was the same is again very very rewarding so it, it is making a difference to the, the customers of the nebrc so what are your top tips then for businesses to become more cyber secure Yes, so uh, the, I'm going to reiterate my points about password security and multi-factor authentication. So installing multi-factor authentication will reduce the likelihood that your password, if ever compromised, they do gain access to your account. Uh, but also making sure that your passwords aren't going to be compromised in the first place is another huge important thing. So using if you're not going to be using a password manager, using three random words. So what that means is you make a short sentence or up a bit about that company um, that you're logging into and it is three words long. So that means it's normally quite long. The password becomes more complex because it's longer and can you can put capital letters, lowercase, full stops, any symbol that you wanted in there, as well as numbers to mix up and make sure that the password is less likely to be guessed by someone so then we hear about lots of ransomware attacks and that being the real big thing so how does how does somebody outside get in to do that ransomware so if you are on your home computer just sat at home on your home wi-fi 
the most likely event that's going to lead to your machines compromised is going to be a phishing email. So we've all seen them, we've all heard about them, which are the current good ones that are going around are you've got something for import from Royal Mail or you've got an Amazon package, but we need to pay import tax. So click this link and potentially it could be a file that you need to download, a form that they want you to fill in and send back to them that could have malware in it, which again, would compromise your machine if you don't have an antivirus running. Um, with Windows and Macs, they do have some sorts of antivirus built into them, but people that are out there doing these kinds of attacks are relatively clever. They have put a lot of time and effort in trying to circumvent these kinds of things. But for you at a home user, make sure that what you're clicking is legitimate check the email address and if you're ever unsure go to the actual company's website and download the form directly from the company's website instead of clicking whatever's included in an email uh, there are other ways to be compromised as well but that is the the biggest one for the end users and small businesses that's going to be able to compromise their machines oh it comes back to people again in the end it does it does so what do you think is the biggest thing that you've learnt by working for the NEBRC along the way? Again, it's the, the relatability to people. You can talk very, very technically to other people in the tech sector. Uh, a system admin or a web developer will understand what you're talking about, about another IT system, even if they don't use that. Quite a lot of the underlying principles are always the same. They, they, they understand how computers work to a fundamental level. Whereas... When you're talking to people that have small businesses or you're talking to people that don't know a lot about IT, they just kind of use it, being able to, to talk to them about the technology in a way that makes them understand and makes them able to sort of interpret what you're saying and why the internet is the way it is and why vulnerabilities or people or malware is the thing that it is. That's what the NEBRC I've learned the most working with the NEBRC is that understandability and relatability to non-techie people or not not system administrators, not the people that I normally work with on a daily basis, which is an incredibly rewarding experience to be able to now go out and it doesn't matter where I am, I can be able to talk about technology to someone in a way that that would help them understand it and get some kind of conversation going about whether it be cyber security or business, web business or any of those kinds of things obviously we have a lot of satisfied clients matt so thanks for that so in your opinion you're early on in your career you're just starting out how do you think your job will evolve over the next few years what do you think the next big thing will be for both an attack and defense it's going to be the automation side it's going to be the ai side that is going to start filtering through and instead of just big large companies using it it's going to filter down into the hands of both end users and for uh, cyber criminals and the reason that that is both a good and a bad thing is on a defense side if we can train an ai or have advanced threat detection that automatically goes out and rectifies errors based on what it's learned that means that there's near instantaneous response for potential compromise for end users for automated scanning which will make the world a safer place but on the other side you're going to have companies cyber co corporations and cyber criminals that are going to be potentially using this for the bad side they're going to train it to what is the most successful phishing attempt what's the most successful uh, malware entry and it's going to go out and try and automatically do that 24 hours a day 365 days a year without the, the criminal being able to interact with it or potentially just getting a list of names afterwards which with what's going to be most probable to gain entry to their system. And again, for a business side, AI, big data, all those kinds of things are going to increase the amount of potential revenue that the business can earn because they'll be able to identify clients more easily. They'll be able to streamline their workflow. They'll be able to, to use these kinds of technologies in their own business to accelerate their growth. But again, it could lead to more compromise. The more systems you put in, the more complex the IT gets, the more likely it is you're going to need someone to manage it properly. And if not, user configurations are more likely to occur. So you go in this loop of 
that's been happening since the internet began of new technology, great business implements it, gets compromised, security goes and fixes it. And it's a never ending circle of this continuous thing. But AI, big data, all of those kinds of things are going to be, in my opinion, the the next big security race. Yeah, as ever, it keeps evolving. It does. So, Matt, that's been amazing to talk to you today. It's lovely to see where you've come from when you first joined us to where you are now. I wish you every success with your future career. Uh, and obviously all of our alumni are invited to stay in touch uh, and come back and mentor new students. So I hope to keep on seeing you soon. Yes, definitely keep in contact. Thank you ever so much, Matt. No problem. Thank you very much.